Hello, I'm Edith Hall and I'm absolutely delighted to be back at my old stomping ground of the Archive of Performances of Greek and Roman Drama to talk about the book I've written with Henry Stead, A People's History of Classics. Now this is a 200,000 word uh, blockbuster um, which examines all kinds of avenues by which um, non-elites, uh, poor and working class people in Britain and Ireland could access the worlds of the ancient Greeks and Romans between the glorious revolution of 1689 and 1939, a neat 250 years. And we look at it from many different angles. Um, we look at it from the point of view of workers' reading culture, uh, the kind of um, uh, cheap magazines that they could afford, especially in the 19th century, the poetry that they read and that they wrote, uh, their life writing, the visual culture that they could get access to. But one of the most important strands, which does keep returning throughout the book, in many different chapters, is performance culture of many different kinds. And that's all the way from really quite um, elaborate London uh, West End stage theatricals, all the way down to um, very déclassé working men's clubs and um, really porn pornography shows and uh, the sorts of uh, travelling one-man bands that might go around on the tavern circuit. The first one that we really talk about is um, the extraordinary phenomenon of the early 18th century fairground spectacle. The most famous of these was by a man called Elkanah Settle, and it was called Siege of Troy. And this had a 60 strong cast acting out an extraordinarily subversive version of uh, uh, Dryden's uh, book two of Dryden's translation of the Aeneid. But this was a version of the Troy saga where the Trojans weren't defeated. Well, all, all the aristocrats were killed, but a, a heroic cobbler named Bristle, Trojan cobbler, managed to uh, do a deal with the Greeks. And it all ends with a really massive carousal and fantasies of, of levelling. Then as we go through um, the book, there is a whole chapter devoted to the phenomenon of um, the uh, late Georgian history plays by James Sheridan Knowles, who was an Anglo-Irish radical playwright who used uh, Plutarch, really, uh, the stories of the um, ancient Roman heroes, especially the Gracchi brothers, to basically protest against the corruption of the monarchy, the lack of um, democratic reform, lack of parliamentary reform. He was influenced by French revolutionary theatre, but his Caius Gracchus which uh, premiered in 1815, just as the, the worst of the post-Napoleonic Wars famines were kicking in um, and continued to be played in, in before and after Peterloo in Belfast, in Edinburgh, in Glasgow and in London. This provides us, um, it was, it was uh, William McCready, the great Republican <laughs> actor who took the role of Caius Gracchus, and it was a really loud polemic against the monarchy and against the poverty and hunger that the working class was suffering. And of course, it got radically censored by the Lord Chamberlain. And we're able to trace very particularly what, what lines, which are all the most political ones, that the Lord Chamberlain put his blue pencil through. Uh, in later chapters, we explore, for example, a very toxic use of classics and class in, in, in relation to the theatre with the uh, weird phenomenon of Caractacus musicals and playlets performed by Welsh school children in the Edwardian era. They were all very enthused by Lord George and they identified him with Caradog or Caractacus, the ancient British chieftain who the Welsh had, ra had rather adopted as, as specifically Welsh on, on slightly dubious grounds. But this is the heroic equivalent of Boudicca. He's the one who, who leads uh, Britons against, against the tyranny of Rome and gives a defiant speech in the Roman Forum. But the purpose ideologically of this play, and it was all very, very deliberate, was to introduce history plays into Welsh schools that would make them proud of their legacy, uh, use Tacitus, and very definitely contributed to the success of Lloyd George's recruitment drive uh, in, in World War One, which was extraordinarily successful in Wales, a very large number of unemployed and uh, mining uh, men from Wales died in the trenches. We've got far more fun with the sort of low life performance cultures. And these range from traveling a showman like Billy Purvis, one of my favorite guys. He's a Scottish bagpiper. He performs bagpipes. But 
began to realise that what was needed was some entertainment, especially for the wives and children on the racetracks of Northern England, these Geordie racetracks, like concert and um, places like that, Corbridge. And one of the greatest hits of these, and we've got an extraordinary painting of it, which is uh, in, 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 in an art gallery in Newcastle, uh, is of his version of Nathaniel Lee's great restoration tragedy, The Rival Queens, which is basically about shenanigans in Alexander the Great's camps. <laughs> that this was a hit of the sort of proletariat going on to lay their, their bets on um, horses in the north of England is really a wonderful story. And further south, we have the phenomenons of the, the phenomena of the uh, sapient pigs and dogs who were named after ancient Greeks and Romans. One of them was actually said to be a reincarnation of Pythagoras, who would do stunts um, in taverns, especially around the Northamptonshire circuit, uh, where they would do things like, for example, woof or snuffle or bark or do their paws or snouts pointing at different books so that they could answer questions about obvious metamorphoses. They answered questions about Plutarch's heroes. And further south, actually, in uh, central London, our great hero is Renton Nicholson, who ran an extraordinary club out of the Coal Hole Tavern on the Strand, which I'm pleased to say is still one of the favourite watering holes, or again, one of the favourite watering holes of the Classics Department at King's College London. But his shows had, uh, I mean, they were basically strip, strip shows. He had sex workers acting out scenes from Apuleius's Metamorphoses, the Cupid and Psyche story, or um, Andromeda being saved half naked from her rock, or various other winsome ladies of, of, of classical myth and history with very few clothes on indeed. But these were um, a great hit. We also had all sorts of different performers doing things like um, uh, pretending to be Hercules and doing strength performances, weightlifters. But at that point, I'm going to hand over to the real expert on beauty and strength performers in classical costumes, who is my colleague, Henry Stead. Thank you.